So we're kicking off a new series called Relatable on relationships. And I don't know about you, but I'm pretty excited about that because um, you know relationships are tricky in life, and I don't know if you're dealing with any relationship issues. Anybody excited about a series on relationships? Uh, Passion City? Okay, that's pretty good. So um, anybody struggling with uh, unresolved conflict from the past that you'd like to know if reconciliation can happen? We're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, anybody, husbands and wives, and you got some issues going on right now, it's okay to say that in front of them because they already know it. Um, <laughs> It, it, we're going to talk about that a little bit. It's sons and daughters struggling with stuff with moms and dads. Moms and dads struggling, struggling with stuff with sons and daughters. We're going to talk about that. Because what we wanted to do was ask a question right off the bat. Are you able to relate? Are you the kind of person that's going to move through life that's able to have relationships that are meaningful and fulfilling and significant? Are you going to be the kind of husband that's able to to relate? Are you going to be the kind of coworker, friend who's able to relate to other people? Because I think a lot of us sometimes think, you know what? Other people have that personality where they're, they're effervescent and everybody loves them and they're, they're a people person. And then we say, well, I'm not really a people person. So, you know, for me, relationships don't come easily and I'm not really good at relationships. They're, they're a lot better than me at relationships. But I believe God has put us on planet earth with seven plus billion people, and he's connected us into relationships that are not going to go away. I want to put out a big ID today. I want to let you think about it. You can agree with it or disagree with it. You can, you can see it uh, this way or you can see it a different way, but I think it is a fundamental idea that we have to all rally around before we start talking about the other relationships in our lives, and this is that idea. I believe to the degree to which you and I receive what God has given and is given us, to that degree, we are going to be able to have meaningful and fulfilling relationships with yourself, with ourselves, and with other people. Let me say it a different way. Your ability to receive what God has given and is giving you. And do you understand that God is wanting to give you amazing things right now? Right now, God is wanting to give amazing things into your life. And there are two reasons why we don't take on board what God's wanting to give us right now. Number one is we don't think we're worthy of God giving us amazing things in our lives. And we say things like this to God, I know you're good and I know you're amazing and I know you're perfect, but I don't think I am worthy of receiving amazing things and beautiful things and perfect things. So I'm not going to receive what you're trying to give me right now. The second reason we don't receive what God's trying to give us is because we've heard another voice in our lives that got us deceived into some other path of thinking what we have is currently better than what God wants us to give or receive. And we heard that so beautifully in the giving today. I would have to let go of what I have so I could open my hands to receive what God wants to give me. And I'm not sure what God wants to give me is better than what I currently have. And we get stuck in that zone. So we've got stuff in our lives that's keeping us from receiving the best of God for our lives because we think what we already currently have in our lives is possibly better than what God would give us for our lives. Or we're over here on the other side of the equation saying, you know, I know God is good and I know God gives good gifts and I know God really does want to give amazing things to us, but I don't feel worthy of God doing that in my life. And so I'm not going to receive what God has for me. And I think this is the fundamental idea today. The degree to which, or the ability to which you and I receive what God has given us, which is everything, by the way, and what he currently wants to give us, which is the unfolding of everything to that degree, that is going to be the number one shaper of your ability to have a meaningful and fulfilling relationship with yourself. Hello? Because that's where relationships start. Your relationship with you is, apart from God, your relationship with you is the most important relationship you have. And to have a meaningful and successful relationships with other people. At the end of the day, I believe the love of God trumps whatever else we have experienced in life. Therefore, the fundamental idea is not what was your dad like and not what was your mom like. The fundamental idea, because you might not can change that, the fundamental idea is how willing are you and what is your capacity to receive what God is wanting to give you today? Because that's going to be not your mom and not your dad. That's going to be the number one shaper of your ability 
to have a meaningful and successful relationship with yourself and with the people around you. And that's really the heart of your marriage. It's the heart of how you're getting along with your roommate. It's the heart of how you're going to approach a relationship with a boyfriend or girlfriend. It's at the heart of you reconciling relationships that have been busted apart, where everybody's waiting each other out on who's going to make the first move and who's going to step in and help this thing be repaired or can it be repaired. I believe it begins with our ability to receive what God has given us and wants to give us in life. I'll show you a way that that pl plays out because there, there are a couple flaws in our relationships and I just wanna touch on a few of them. Number one flaw I think that we experience in relationships is we expect more of other people than they can realistically be and give to our lives. Hello? We expect more of other people than they can be and give to our lives. Let me give you an example of that. So you're a young, single person. You're, uh, you, you, you're hoping to find a Mr. Perfect one day, and in your mind, you've already figured it out. You know, Maybe you got some stuff that you've dealt with, uh, but that's okay because this dude is gonna arrive, and um, he's gonna have perfect hair, best hair ever, and, um, or maybe you're into no hair. That's great too. Um, and whatever it is that you know, floats your boat, you're thinking he's gonna arrive, and he's coming in on a magic carpet, and when he sweeps into the, in, into the room, the, the temperature's gonna change, the atmosphere's gonna change, the music's gonna play, the lights are gonna come on, that magic carpet's gonna swoop down, and he's gonna look me in my eyes, and he is gonna tell me I'm the greatest thing that ever happened. And I mean, right then and there, everything I've wrestled with in life is gonna resolve right in that moment in the hands of this wonderful man that comes into my life. And he's gonna become the fountainhead of everything I've been needing all of my life. And that's a great dream, <laughs> except for the fact that he's coming in a Toyota Corolla <laughs> dismissing a hubcap on one tire. And he's not only going to become the fountainhead for all the things you've needed in life. He's gonna become the mirror that shows you all the things that you've needed in your life. And he is not going to solve and resolve everything you've longed for in your life. He is only gonna amplify your annoyance factor and your frustration factor about all the unresolved things in your life. Because he's not gonna be perfect. But thank God Jesus is, and he's already, he's already available. Hey, you ever get in a conflict? Anybody ever had an argument with somebody? Uh, husbands, wives, any husbands, wives argue here, and, uh, and somebody makes a really big case, one or the other, I don't know who it was the last week, and they come into you and they say, look, I, I just need to tell you, you're, you're, I just need to let you know how I feel. And you're, you're really not this and that and the other and blah, 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 blah. And here's the four things you're not doing. And here's the, the one thing you need to change. And here's two specific examples from yesterday that are, are good, you know, kind of like if you, need, if you need a picture, you know, if it all looks like formula and mystery, then here's a picture. Don't do this or do this more. And then they give you the backstory. And, you know, you've always been like that. And you've done this in the past. And remember 20 years ago and on that day we were on vacation in Florida and you did it then on that day. And, you know, it, all this whole thing comes along. And how do you respond to that typically? How do you respond to that typically? Typically you say, wow, that is so true. Thank you for telling me that. Because I want to be a man or a woman whose life stands the test of time, who can provide shade for the generations to come, built on the foundation of Jesus that shines light to the world. Thank you for telling me that today. You're absolutely right. Well, let's break it down. What should I start working on today? You know? No, but that's normally not what happens. What normally happens? What does the other person respond with? Well, it's funny that you're saying that. <laughs> because, you know, let's go back to point B over there for a second. If there's anybody who, like, is a grandmaster international champion of that, that would be you. 
And I just, it's amazing that you're telling me that you think I should fix that because come on, if somebody writes the, that for dummies, it's gonna be you because you, you have got that down. You have mastered that. You're amazing at that. You are like the best one of those I've ever met. Let me give you a oh, hundred examples. You have a second, that time, that time, that time. That's what you're doing that to me. You see, we have an amazing way of always flipping it around to the other person and saying, you, this standard. Me, on the other hand, different standard. And what I expect from you is certainly not what I necessarily want all the time from God. I want him to give me way more slack than I'm gonna give you right now. And I think that what, the way we blow all this up is by putting the gospel in the middle of our relationships. And I wanna do that today by asking three questions. Number one question is, can God, specifically, can Jesus relate to you? The second question I wanna ask today is, how does Jesus relate to you? Because that's gonna be an important definer of how we relate to each other. And the third question I wanna ask is, how does this impact the way I relate to others? Can Jesus relate to you? How does Jesus relate to you? And how does this impact the way I relate to others? Is he able to relate to you? And I think it's an important question. I wanna give you a couple of answers. I believe the answer is a resounding yes, and here's why. Firstly, because he entered time and space. So we're gonna talk theologically just for a second. Jesus existed outside of time and space from eternity past to eternity future. Jesus has always been Jesus. But then Jesus created a universe and he created a universe with time and with space. And if that wasn't enough, then he entered into time and he entered into space. Space, And we don't think like this about Jesus enough, but he gave up the freedom of floating above time and space, and he took on the constraints of entering into time and space. So before he was born, Jesus could go from one side of eternity to the other side of eternity faster than you could bat your eyelash. But when he entered into time and space, if he wanted to go from Jerusalem to Galilee, he had to walk on a road. And it took the same amount of time for him to walk as it would take for an able-bodied one of us to walk on the road. And he chose to enter into time and space. And we're going to talk about why that matters. The second thing Jesus did was he took on flesh and blood. So he could have come down. He could have done it and just come down as Jesus. He could have just come down out of the sky. There I am. But he was born of a woman. Now, this is the miracle of the immaculate conception of God by the Holy Spirit in the womb of a virgin girl. But come on, can we just say, wow, one more time today, that God Almighty was born of a woman. He had an umbilical cord. The poorest of the poor and the richest of the rich and the toughest of the tough. The ladies in the story, the men in the story, Jesus somehow had this amazing ability to be able to relate to them all. So what are you struggling with right now? You talk to Jesus about it, he's not gonna look at you and go, oh man, I don't know. He's gonna go, oh, I know. Time and space, flesh and blood, I know. Second question is, how does he relate? This is pretty amazing. How does Jesus relate to you? Are you ready for these? You should write these down. Number one, he does not give us what we deserve. That's how he relates to you. He does not give you what you deserve. Psalm 103, I love the context of this. This is what it says, beginning in verse eight. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor nor will he harbor his anger forever. For he does not, we should read this together. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. That's how Jesus relates to you. You can count on him to not treat you the way you deserve to be treated. 
Secondly, he's going to meet us more than halfway. So he's not going to say, here's heaven and here's you, and I'll come to here if you'll come to here. No, he said, I'm going to come all the way to you. He's merciful when we are wrong. He's gracious when we are stubborn. And he loved us before we were lovable. And if you put the little design parentheses on it, what that really says is he loved us before we were able to love him. Third question, how does this impact how we relate to others? Well, this brings us back to our first question. I think it, it impacts how we relate to others because in the same measure we receive, we give. That's what 1 John 4 says. And this is the last text I wanna to touch on today. In 1 John 4, we see the gospel coming in the middle of our relationships. And it's either amen-worthy or it's groundbreaking and revolutionary. It's seismic for our relationships. Verse seven, dear friends, if you have a translation that says beloved, congratulations, because don't you like that word better right there? It means that you are be loved. You're loved by almighty God, the great I am, whose name is be loves you. You're be loved, but dear friends is okay. I don't like it as much, but it's cool. Uh, dear friends, sounds a little more like we're at a coffee shop. Dear friends, let us love one another. So that's gonna be the goal. Broken relationship, husband, wife, mom, dad, son, daughter, friend, coworker, let us love one another. For love comes from God. So there, there's your whole message for today in a verse. Love comes from God. So it doesn't say let us love one another and you gotta figure out how to do that. It says let us love one another but love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God and everyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Hello. So if you're not loving, it's not because of your dad. It's because you don't know God. If you're not loving other people, it's not because you're of your ex-wife, it's because you don't know God. He says that whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And this is how God showed his love among us. So let's get specific about it. This is how he sent his one and only son into the world that we, can we say we, can we say we together, that we, can we say we, that we, as all of us, might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, because we weren't able to love, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, <laughs> beloved, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. I love that he didn't just say, since God loved us. John 3, 16 doesn't say God loved the world. It says God so loved the world. This passage doesn't say since God loved us. It says since God so loved us. What does the so mean? It just means, oh, wow, this is incredible. Since God so loved us. It's a qualifier that just takes a casual word and puts it up on a, on a whole new heavenly scale. God so loved you. He so loved us. He has so demonstrated overwhelming, triumphing love to us. Then we ought to, having such a great love, love one another. What is it speaking to? To, to that same measure with which we're loved, we love. So that's why the gospel has to be in the middle of our relationships. Let me say it a different way. When we come to know God, God dispenses grace and mercy with a shovel. Do you know what I'm talking about? You, you need grace? I mean, we're getting a shovel way bigger than this one, the biggest one we could get. And I mean, it's a shovel full of grace on your life. You need more today? Well, my mercies are new every single day. So when you wake up, just imagine tomorrow that there's an angel standing by the bed and he's just shoveling mercy and pouring it on you before you even hit the snooze button tomorrow. I'm assuming you're gonna hit the snooze button and he's just saying mercy on your life. This is not yesterday's mercy. This is new mercy today. I got a shovel. We got lots of angels and lots of shovels and it's like mercy on your life today. Mercy on your life. Big shovel of mercy on your life.